to Charlie to uh, put an invitation to come and present my work here. This is some new research. has a lot of, a couple of papers around this theme, but I'm presenting just one today about France. Who does not like France, right? So I want to have you some, some maps. No wine, but we're going to get close to that. Policymakers are in the business of trying to create, uh, you know, enhance uh, common well-being, uh, promoting prosperity, uh, and enhancing the human experience. At least we hope they are on that business. And one way to do so is to uh, believe to be uh, enhancing credit to access, uh, access to credit. And, uh, and, and so an idea that being uh, played with is that uh, if you enhance uh, uh, credit access, you may help uh, firms uh, invest uh, and spend, and so the consumers as well. And, uh, and it goes in a cycle. We call this the credit multiplier in economics. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, you fuel the economy with, with spending and investing and more credit as a function of the very spending and investing that you fund it, that you fund it. Now, how can we promote this as, as policymakers? So it is hard to change economic uh, agents' beliefs and behaviors, but it's easy, to some extent, to change uh, laws governing credit. Okay, so policymakers have introduced revolutionized, tightened, loosened all sorts of, of laws and regulations and even practices governing financial contracting. Now, the question is, you know, is this good? Uh, you know, what good does it do? What are the risks involved? Uh, when does it work and when it doesn't work? You know, so many questions, so little time. I don't have time to answer all those questions. But let me show you a few examples where, of where things have gone bad and gone uh, well. So, you know, one way to look into uh, ways to make credit uh, easy uh, is to what I'm going to call here lawlessness, which is to say, make it easy to anyone, for anyone to acquire anything they want. And uh, so I'm making it kind of jokingly, but it's, uh, up until recently, the goal of uh, institutions such as Freddie Mac was to, if you went to the website, it is something like, and now anyone that wants to buy any home to, you know, finance and made it possible, made it feasible. And, uh, you know, the way that you conducted that uh, for a while in the U.S., a little less today, but for a while, uh, you know, people just ignore standards for sound lending. It's a simple, it makes it easy, right? Uh, you just ignore credit rules and uh, practices, and you end up having agents with uh, no credit worthiness, getting loans based on overinflated assets uh, with even little down payment, right? A lot of incentives for you to get more credit even. Right, so this is uh, me walking downtown Chicago in 2007. I live nearby. So I'm sure same pictures you'll find in New York City too, right? If you buy my apartment, you get, you get a car, right? So condos for sale, you know, free Toyota if you come in and apply for a loan. So the incentives to have this gun, you know, this thing going through the system was very, very high. So no one was willing to tell the truth during low origination, and uh, uh, no one was willing to rate risk appropriately nor even monitor the repayment process. Okay, so why so? Because you just repackage it, secretize it, and have someone else pay for it later. So this is not, this is just to say, that's not the kind of credit expansion uh, under the law, uh, changes that we want to see happening anymore. A little critical, but that's one way to look at it. Now, what people have proposed in, in, in the opposite to make credit more uh, 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 available more, uh, you know, easily available is to instead of having lawlessness or easy laws, having tougher laws. And so the idea here is that uh, uh, you have all these cross-country studies looking to, uh, in the case that, uh, you know, many times when you make credit more protective of uh, lenders, you have more lenders coming and extending credit, or, uh, credit to, say, companies. Uh, we call this uh, the idea of a strengthening creditors' rights. And a lot of papers show that if you go across countries comparing countries with more tighter regulations on credit, giving more power to the creditors vis-a-vis -vis those that give less power to the creditors, you have more finance, and so therefore must be a good thing to enhance creditor rights. Now, a new wave of research, though, looking to within-country comparisons, not across countries, you know, countries are different in many ways, but if you look into within, what happens within countries, many times those laws have the perverse, reverse effect, which is to have companies less willing to uh, offer their assets as collateral if they think bankers will easily uh, take them back, uh, take them away from the companies, right? So, so you see the opposite. And many times you have even more complications when you have court efficiency as an issue. Uh, when you have court involvement in the process, we know courts tend to be not so efficient, and you end up seeing less um, rather than more uh, 
more credit. So the bottom line is that giving more power to a party of a contract or emphasizing court involvement may not be the best way to go either to enhance access to credit. So what to do? Uh, theory says that uh, the way to approach this problem is by something that I like to call enhancing or enlarging the contract space. Uh, theory says that if you want to have two parties coming together to sign a contract, well, you better give them more information and more flexibility in writing that contract, right? Designing it with more flexibility. Uh, you know, it's not, uh, it's not about uh, uh, having the court involved. It's not about giving more power to one party vis-a-vis -vis the other. That does not prompt them to get together and sign a, a contract, okay? So I'm gonna, you know, make the case that it is rare to see reforms or changes uh, by regulators that work on that dimension, but one recent one, it happened in France 10 years ago, uh, it is what I think is a prime example of a change that is, uh, uh, truly leads to a healthy, uh, what I'm gonna call democratization of access to credit, which means you have more credit being extended to more uh, people. In this case, we're talking about uh, corporations, okay, small corporations. So it's part of my work with, uh, with two co-authors in, uh, in Manchester, uh, that's the paper style. Okay. So what's the idea? We look into what happened in France, and in that country, I'm gonna make the case, that there was a law change that made it easier for companies to uh, raise debt. And that will be on the basis of what kind of collateral, what kind of assets they could offer to, to, uh, uh, to lenders, say banks. Okay. So uh, before the law passed, and it was recent, 2006, this is a statement by the French uh, Minister, of, Minister of Justice. He, he went to address Parliament, and let me just say things, things they said. You know, do I need to remind you that currently a borrower, this is 2005, a borrower, for example, a company, has to hand over the property that it pledges. Do, do you know a modern country that works in that way? Okay, so even over to recently in France, uh, you had uh, companies having to hand over uh, the assets that they pledge in a collateral, uh, in a transaction that was collateralized. Now, this law came in 2006 uh, uh, that changed everything. So the law essentially did something that may seem, look simple, which is to derogate uh, what's called the notion of possessory asset ownership, okay? which means that if I own, say, this chair, this chair really belongs to me. This chair is unique, and uh, any hard asset like this chair needs to be uh, pledged if I wanna, as a company, I wanna borrow against this hard asset here. Right? So that means I process it. If I give it to you, then it's yours now, no longer mine. Uh, and so this looks small, but that meant that little change, so to speak, meant that uh, you know, assets were no longer unique, non-transferable, and non-substitutable. Uh, instead, they could be. Uh, and uh, you know, because uh, you know, that situation put limit on things such as collateralization because it did require uh, total transfer of possession, physical possession of assets. Uh, you could not say, uh, lend against half of this chair, no fractions. I could not lend against, you know, having two types of, uh, of creditors against the shares. Could not have sequence, uh, 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 multiple pleasure videos, a sequential ownership. Okay, so, and I couldn't substitute even. So this chair is this chair. This other chair is this some, something else completely different. So it wouldn't be able, it wouldn't be able to offer uh, substitute assets in the, not even cash equivalents on a transaction. So it clearly makes it very, very hard to do anything in this economy, right? So it could not pledge assets. Uh, and still keep operating those assets essentially in-house. Okay, so the economy worked a lot like a, a pawn shop economy. Right? So we really have to hand over the assets. Uh, and the issue was the law wouldn't perfect, as we call it in, in the jargon, would not perfect an asset uh, as collateral unless you actually own it and held it uh, in, in the premises. So this law changed everything. And uh, in the situation we had, you inhibited up until then Secretization, uh, uh, syndication, or even the recharge, right? So very bad. Uh, interesting though, just gonna create a wrinkle. Uh, companies uh, operating in the largest cities in France, they already have figured out this doesn't work, this is not very good, uh, and they bypassed the so-called Napoleonic, Napoleonic Code with what's called uh, non-codified laws. So they lobbied their Congress to pass those laws that would essentially allow them to pledge uh, liquid assets, not hard assets, those are hard to uh, go around the, the, the code, but liquid asset was easy to, assets were easy to 
to collateralize uh, two factoring companies. Okay? So depending on what kind of asset you operate, you may have an easier time or a harder time in raising credit. Now, the catch here, though, is that factoring companies in France only operated in large cities. So the law already you know, had lost its effect for firms that operated in large cities and have mostly liquid assets, so to speak. So in this economy, uh, in this environment, financing is perverse. Financing is relationship-based, favors large firms, well-established, well-connected, at the expense of small, young, and innovative firms. Right? So uh, uh, the question we ask is, so can a collateral reform, such as the law is called Ordinance 2060-46, ease access to credit to whom and by how much? Is this something that can really, what we call, uh, uh, made it uh, credit more democratic, right? So we're going to, in economics, we like to use this approach called the difference and difference approach, which is essentially putting a lot of contrast on the data to separate causation from correlation, if you will. So we're going to be comparing here, uh, you know, assets, firms and assets, uh, if they operate assets which are hard vis-a-vis -vis liquid, more fixed assets vis-a-vis -vis cash equivalents, or whether they are near or far from uh, fracturing services. And I'm going to make comparisons to try to understand if a law like this that makes it easier to hand over collateral uh, without, or to, to raise debt against collateral without actually having to physically uh, hand it over makes it easier for firms to raise credit and by whom and where do they, uh, are they located. Okay? So I'm going to do mostly through graphs. So let me show you uh, one example now. So I'm going to you know, have one table but mostly show you graphs of this reform. Okay? So here's the idea. Look into what happens to firms' leverage ratios, debt over assets, before and after this reform as a function of the amount of fixed assets that they had. Okay? So this is the change. The red line is, represents a change in the leverage of firms that had a lot of fixed assets. As you can see, they grow a lot right after the reform. Now, if you compare similar firms, similar industry, similar size, uh, but that have less, uh, of physical assets, hard assets, the increase is very low. Okay, so this is what we call a difference in the difference field. It's a difference between the two types before and after. Okay? And so that sounds interesting, but maybe it's not about this collateral story I'm talking about. It's just the ability to raise debt somehow related to other uh, characteristics of the assets, not necessarily uh, with the, uh, how hard the assets are, or even the context they write on them. So look at this other contrast here. So let's look into what we call a falsification. Okay, so this is the leverage ratio for short-term debt. Short-term debt was backed by liquid assets which were not affected by the reform. Okay. So as you can see, no matter how much of fixed assets that you had, uh, your borrowing stayed the same before and after the reform. The reform is right here in the middle. But if you're looking to actually borrowing against long-term long debt against the hard assets, that's where the change comes from. Okay, so this is decomposing the previous figure I had into two categories. So what else do you do? So it says that you know, there is evidence of fresh debt taking. So this is, go back a second, this is okay. I see firms that have some leverage, they go up. If we talk about democratization, you want to reach firms that had no debt before uh, this reform, right? So, so let's look into some what I'm going to call fresh debt taking or you know, a growth in a credit on the extensive margin, not on the intensive margin, but on the extensive margin, bridging out more people, more agents. Okay? So this is uh, the evolution of, uh, of short-term uh, debt. Uh, this is the proportion of firms that had zero short-term debt, very little, which means most firms have some short-term debt, and it stays constant over time, before and after the reform. Now, this is the proportion of firms that had uh, no long-term debt. Okay? So most firms in France had no long-term debt before the reform. And they have, this proportion falls dramatically after the reform. And fall also, importantly enough for us, as a function of the amount of fixed assets that they, that they control. Okay, so not just randomly, but uh, you know, everything I show in this picture to you is monotonically increasing, which is interesting in previous as well, as a function of the amount of fixed assets that they have in their balance sheets. And therefore now able to to, uh, to uh, collateralize, use its collateral uh, in, a, in a credit transaction. Okay, and that's what we call a democratization. More firms, these are firms which are outside of the market. They now come into the market, far fewer uh, firms outside uh, of the market. 
So, you know, economists, we have some fuzzy tables, and I'm going to cover it right now. I'm skipping it to you, but just say, a point to say is the following. If you actually get into the data, after the, 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 the reform happens, firms which are treated, uh, meaning firms that have high fixed assets, those are the ones that actually increase their leverage. That's what this is saying. OK, so questions arise. OK, that sounds interesting. So you have new companies coming to the, to the, to the economy in terms of in, to the capital markets. Who are they? So we kind of just described the very you know, basic statistics, you know, their size and profitability. And let's compare here the, the gray bar, which is the average first, uh, French firm, with the red bar, which are the, what, what we call the new borrowers. Okay, so they are the companies that come into the market. What are their characteristics? Well, these new companies, they are now borrowers. Uh, they are smaller. So looking to the average size, uh, uh, if you compare the gray bar and the red bar, they're smaller. They're more profitable less likely to run a loss, uh, lower profit volatility, and also are more cash strapped. Okay? Interesting enough, and I'll explore this in some more detail next, they are further away from bigger cities. So this is a location distance from uh, large cities in France. They tend to be in the interior, at least appears to be so. Okay? So what do you think, oh, this is the right margin of borrowers you want to have come into the capital markets or the credit markets. They're small, they need the finance, they're profitable, and they're not likely to fail because you don't want to have uh, the marginal firms who are going to load up on debt and then fail tomorrow, uh, you know, come into the capital markets. You instead like to have perhaps these kinds of guys here. Okay. Now, talking about democratization, do I have any evidence that uh, there is more credit being extended to new firms across France, not just in Paris and the biggest cities, uh, but how about the whole country? Right? So France is divided in uh, departments. 96 departments. And so uh, this is looking to the, uh, the average uh, leverage, so to speak, debt ratio of firms uh, in various departments in France. Okay, so we add up to 96. So most departments, 30 of them, uh, for them, the average leverage of firms was somewhere between 0 and 2%, very, very low, before the reform. After the reform, you see a shift. Most departments have uh, firms with average leverage ratios, long-term debt, of you know, between 4 and 8%. Okay? So this is really going across different areas in the country. I'm not just getting you know, firms in Paris. That's not what's happening here. And look into the same comparison for zero leverage firms. Most departments had a lot of firms that were zero leverage, 80% even, okay, in this peak here. Uh, after, that's before the reform. After the reform, uh, you know, far fewer uh, zero leverage firms. The proportion of zero leverage firms falls dramatically. Okay, so meaning firms have access to credit now. They're no longer outsiders. Now, where are exactly those borrowers located? So this is a, a heat map where we can, uh, by address, uh, uh, find uh, where are those firms that actually uh, raise their debt and not significantly enough. This is here, long-term debt raise and increases, or even firms that for the first time come into the capital markets before, it's a change before vis-a-vis -vis after the reform. So this is a heat picking up the, 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 the amount of, in the change around the year we're talking about. And interestingly enough, right, they seem to live far from the bigger cities. So I also highlighted cities, uh, the 10 largest cities uh, in France, the capital uh, markets, where the, lease com the uh, uh, factoring companies are located and leasing companies as well. And as you can see, the increase happens everywhere but in the big cities, right? So these are the firms which are most benefit, uh, the most uh, benefited from, from this change in the regulation. Okay. Just a couple more results. I'm excited about these results. Uh, we look into something that economists like to use, a tool, uh, to calculate uh, the, uh, the, the degree of, uh, of, of disparity, of inequality across uh, uh, economic uh, agents. Uh, so typically we talk about this thing, uh, the, Gini in Gini index as, the Gini index as a, uh, uh, a degree to which uh, you know, the wealthier people have more wealth than the poor people. We can do the same here for having credit access uh, in, uh, in, in across firms. So not people's incomes, but firms' uh, access to credit. So this is a map for France. Uh, uh, it's a very dark, meaning Credit is very highly concentrated in every department. This is by department. There are 96 of them here. 
Uh, the average uh, Gini index was 95, very, very dark. This is before the reform. Uh, when you go after the reform, you have an incredible decline in the Gini index across the country. But again, interestingly enough, it's mostly outside, outside the larger cities. Okay? So I, and I could not be better drawn. You know, it's, it's almost, it's, it went incredibly well to show that the access to credit really happens uh, in, 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 in towns and, and places that are far from, from the larger cities. So this is uh, go down to the level of Germany, was before it said very, very high, highest in the Western Europe, uh, and now it's down to uh, uh, the lower levels that we see in Western Europe, such as uh, Germany. Just a couple more results. Uh, we looked into other consequences of credit. So those firms got money. Apparently, they have a lot of debt. That's interesting, or access to that. What do they do with the money? And so this is a table, uh, but it's simple to understand. The idea is that those firms that were treated, that had access to credit because they had high fixed assets, after the reform, what do they do? Uh, they invest more. They hire more people. Uh, the sales performance enhances and more profitable. And profitability declines, okay? So they kind of do the money exactly what we wish to, uh, them to do. They were what we call financially constrained before. They had good ideas, potentially good investments. They, did, they lacked the access to credit. And now as we throw in credit to them, the way it was done, by just allowing, we're not looking the other way in context, we're just allowing people to contract on a larger menu of assets, of, of, of items for collateral. That's all we're doing. We're just giving flexibility for signing a credit agreement. So, and, uh, and look into employment metrics, which were interesting in this paper, in this research, uh, what happens across France. So this is the same idea of a heat map. Now we look into not leveraging firms, but employment, uh, how many people they hire, the average wages, uh, and factor productivity of, of labor. And there are two interesting coincidences, so to speak, that the same areas that flare up uh, on the debt-taking dimension also are the ones that flare up on the labor <coughs> variables that we have here. So these firms, they hire more people, those who had more access to credit. They uh, have an increase in the average wage that they pay, they can, and the average productivity of, of labor goes up as well by more. Okay, so we really now pin down by the address, if you will, who took the money that we gave, and what do they do with the money? And so the outcomes seem to be um, uh, very interesting, and one would say positive. Right? So you like to have that kind of trickled, uh, trickle down effect uh, when you do a reform like this. My last uh, result is to say that uh, in economics, we like to see if things do, uh, you know, if, if the money goes to industry, say, to sectors that deserve them the most. And one little approach to measure this, uh, you know, where the money is going, is to look into whether the investment in an industry is a function of uh, the value added in that industry, right? So you want the industries that produce more for the economy to receive more funding, so to speak, right? You want this, this sensitivity to be heightened uh, if you have a system where uh, economic efficiency is, uh, is improved. And so this is just a little, uh, you do this regression before and after the, uh, the reform. So you're focusing on the sensitivity here, beta. Uh, before the reform was at a level that equaled uh, Portugal. Uh, uh, you know, 0.43. Uh, after the reform, it goes to a level that is closer to Germany. If you will. Those are metrics for success. Uh, but there is a significant increase in the sensitivity of investment to value added across industries. Okay, so this is, I'm going to you know, stop here on, on this, but this is kind of a showcases the kind of analysis I do in this paper, other paper also, related paper with uh, Mauricio Lorraine, who's a faculty here at Columbia as well. Uh, you know, looking for ways in which you can uh, have regulation that is more, uh, you know, leads to better, uh, to improvement in credit access as opposed to just make it hard for firms and uh, lenders to, to sign contracts. So just to conclude, uh, you know, reforms that are, you know, that govern uh, credit access and, uh, uh, and financial contracts, sometimes they tend to be too easy, make things too easy or too hard. Uh, but what we argue in this line of work that I do is that uh, we have to be, be paying attention to make it easier for, con for, for both parties to see what's happening, to have options uh, in their contracts, and uh, 
potentially also to have less court intervention. Okay? And one textbook example of this reform happened in my mind uh, when France uh, uh, derogated the, uh, asset, uh, the notion of, of possessory asset ownership in France that happened in 2006. And that brought an increase in, uh, in lending along what seems to be the right margin. You have the better firms, or the you know, firms that needed more access to, to finance on the marginal side of the economy having that access. Okay. So you did it simply by uh, enlarging the menu of uh, assets and, uh, that can be offered as collateral uh, by making them uh, non possessory okay. And uh, this enhanced contractability without a greater court in, uh, interference. So, uh, so I'm going to argue, I'm going to argue that this kind of reform can, you know, can lead to something that we all aspire to have, which is uh, the democratization of uh, uh, access uh, to, to credit and finance. Okay. So this is key. My last point: this is key for policymakers. Policymakers cannot contract, you know, uh, you know, manipulate collateral values. They can change collateral values. They cannot change the supply of collateral in the economy, but they can change what is accepted as collateral. Uh, in a credit transaction. This is it. This is what I had to say, Charlie.